Good evening. Uh, we are looking at our first part of chapter three, which is uh, federalism. And we finished up the look at uh, the founding of the country, what the founders did when they were in Philadelphia, what occurred afterwards. So this week we're going to be looking at chapter three. We're going to look at Federalist Paper 51. Uh, we'll review because we're going to have an exam after we get on with chapter three. But there's a lot to there's a lot to, to handle in Chapter 3 from a couple different uh, patterns or ways of looking at how government runs. So first and foremost, let's redefine federalism. Simply, it's this. It's a way of laying out government in which there are two or more levels and they have formal authority over the land and people. So in the United States, we have the national government centered in Washington. We then have the 50 state governments. And then we've got innumerable local governments, all serving a role in performing their governmental functions. Now we know that when we looked at, uh, or when you heard lecture number seven, we talked a little bit about unitary governments, England, is probably the most familiar example of unitary government. And in unitary governments, or authority is, is centralized into one place. So at least until recently in Britain, um, decisions were made in London and they affected the entire country all the way down to the, uh, the local level. That is not necessarily true as reform has come to Britain, but it's certainly true of most unitary countries that this is certainly the way they run their business. Now the third type of the third type of uh, government structure that we looked at was a confederation. There haven't been very many examples. The most famous one of course being the Confederate States of America in which the parts were more powerful than the whole and then right after the breakup of the Soviet Union they became a confederation which lasted a couple years and then it finally went away as those nations went there their separate ways. Now we can see here in our uh, little chart how the central government, the state governments, and the citizens all break down uh, under unitary confederate and federal systems. Now this chart is in your book so I won't spend too much time on it but you do need to look at it to, to notice the differences between uh, the two. So why is federalism important? It's a, it's, for the United States, it decentralizes our politics. And let's look at the word decentralize for a moment. Decentralize means to take away from the center power and give to those who are at lower levels, at least politically. And this gives and has historically given people in the United States more opportunities to participate. Now, again, 50% of us opt out altogether. And so therefore, maybe this isn't such a great example, but you know, when we do have citizens working at what we call the grassroots level, um, it's very different than probably the experiences in most other countries. It also decentralizes our policies. And this is, this is an example, our educational policy. For instance, the money comes from Washington they uh, have things like the IDEA, which is the, uh, uh, the uh, act which brought about or helped to bring about uh, special education. And much of that has sprung since then to the morass that it is nowadays. Uh, but at the same time, the Department of Education in Washington does not choose uh, the kind of tests that are taken in districts. They don't choose textbooks. They have nothing to do with teacher salaries or anything like that. So with education, the most important aspects of it a lot of times are at the local level. Then there, as we move up the food chain, the state comes next and the federal government is kind of uh, off in the distance. Now the bigger picture though is that we know that federal government and state governments handle different problems. So the federal government handles defense. and, and other things. State governments handle more local issues because they're more familiar with the problems in their state. And so federalism helps this kind of system and it makes people feel that their government is actually closer 
uh, to them. So if when we look at, at uh, the things that the states handle, um, it, despite federal pressure to um, have the states have a blanket uh, drinking age, which is what happened, and the exchange for that would be that the states would get plenty of money to maintain their interstate highways, um, but they regulate drinking. States are in charge of marriage. States are in charge of speed limits. Um, federal government does not get involved in those kind of, usually in those kind of issues. Now, the division of power says that uh, the supremacy clause, which is uh, Article Six of the Constitution, states the following. And what they say is the federal government is supreme, and that is by virtue of the U.S. Constitution, the laws of Congress, and treaties. So anything that, but above all, at the apex of the pyramid, of course, is the U.S. Constitution. But all of these things give the government its authority. Yet, the Constitution has Amendment 10. And also, it states in many places in the Constitution, the national government cannot usurp state powers. They can't arbitrarily take powers away from the state. So that makes federalism a little messy, as it well should be. And when you have local, state, and national governments all involved in the same, on the same issue and in the same issue, it's very messy. So we can see here um, some of the powers that are granted in the Constitution. We talked a little bit about this in, Arti in uh, Lecture 7. Um, powers granted by the Constitution to the national government. Powers granted uh, to the national and state governments, also known as uh, concurrent powers. The powers given to the state governments, which are reserved powers. Um, and then we can see down below under the national governments some powers denied by the Constitution. Um, no one can violate the Bill of Rights. No one can change state boundaries except the states themselves. No one can grant be granted a title of nobility. And so on and so forth. But you can see that these are all powers that are denied. And again, this is in your book. You can easily see this in Chapter 3. Now, <clears throat> from the beginning, the meaning of federalism has been open to debate. In the late 18th century, Alexander Hamilton, uh, the first secretary of the treasury, uh, championed loose, what we call loose construction. The view that the constitution sh should be broadly interpreted and the national government, the national government created by the government represented uh, the supreme law of the land. And its powers should be broadly defined and liberally const construed. That's Hamilton. The opposite tact was taken by Jefferson. And he said the federal government was the product of an agreement among the states, and that the main threat to personal liberty was likely to come from the national government. Jefferson's strict construction required that the founders of the national government should be narrowly construed and sharply limited. This famous clash in interpretations of the Constitution shaped the political culture of the United States well into the mid-20th century. Now realizing that they couldn't make a comprehensive list of powers for the national or the state governments, the founders added uh, to Article I the Necessary and Proper Clause. Now this clause states that Congress shall have the power to make all laws which should be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Hamilton's argument for national supremacy relied heavily on the necessary and proper clause. Now the necessary and proper clause is also called the elastic clause. So if you hear one or the other used, know that they're the same thing. Jefferson's state's rights point of view rested partially on the 10th Amendment that reserves powers to the states. 
Now, McCulloch in Maryland, uh, during the early 19th century, which occurred during the early 19th century, um, the Supreme Court tipped the balance of the, of the debate uh, on national supremacy. And what they did was they decided, under the leadership of John Marshall, who was the Chief Justice, that the court would take a view that the national government should have relatively more power than the states. And Marshall advocated this view in a series of decisions, which included the very influential McCullough v. Maryland in 1919. The case arose when James McCullough, the cashier of the Bank of the United States in Baltimore, Maryland, refused to pay a tax levied on the bank by the state of Maryland. When state officials arrested him, McCullough appealed to the Supreme Court. The court's opinion set an important precedent that established national supremacy over states' rights. The case questioned the right of the federal government to establish a bank since no such right is enumerated in Article I. Marshall ruled that the Maryland law that established the tax was unconstitutional with his famous statement, the power to tax is the power to destroy. The power to destroy a federal agency would give the state supremacy over the federal government so the states may not tax a federal agency. Now this issue, states' rights versus federal rights, raged during much of the early 19th century. Now eventually James Madison and Thomas Jefferson defined the state's rights point of view as, uh, as what they call, and the term that's used is nullification. The right of a state to declare null and void a federal law that in the state's opinion violated the Constitution. Before the Civil War, John C. Calhoun led the charge for southern states that claimed the right to declare null and void any attempts by the national government to ban slavery. The issue was settled with the Northern victory uh, over the South in the Civil War. And that once and for all put to, put to bed the, uh, the, the question about who was more powerful, the federal government or the states, and that the federal union is what's called indissoluble. It cannot be dissolved and the states cannot declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. Now five years later, the court had another big case come before it, which tested another one of the federal government's major powers, its commerce powers. And the commerce powers that we're talking about are the, are the powers that come under what's known as the Commerce Clause. Now the meaning of the Commerce Clause was at issue in the 1824 Gibbons v. Ogden case now, Aaron Ogden had, given, had been given exclusive license by the state of New York to operate the steam-powered ferry boats between uh, New York and New Jersey. Thomas Gibbons obtained a license from the U.S. government to operate boats in the same area, and when he decided to compete with Ogden, Ogden sued, and the case went to the Supreme Court. Several issues were at stake in defining federalism. One, the definition of commerce itself. When New York's highest court ruled against Gibbons, it defined commerce narrowly as only the shipment of goods, not navigation or the transport of people. The national government's powers over interstate commerce was a question. And does the national government have the right to control any commerce within a state's boundaries? And third, the state government's powers over interstate commerce it asked this question is interstate commerce a concurrent power that states may share with the national government. Now John Marshall wrote the majority opinion in the case, as you well know from your court cases, and it was an expansive interpretation of the, con of the Commerce Clause. And that, that, uh, that majority opinion increased the national government's authority over all areas of economic affairs. Marshall defined commerce as all business dealings, not just the transfer of goods, and he ruled that the national government could regulate within a state's jurisdiction. On the other hand, interstate commerce is solely the right of the national government, and so the New York court had no right to prohibit Gibbons' trade. 
Now, what has happened since 1824? Well, with the booming Industrial Revolution of the 1800s, the debate over the balance of power between state and national government focused on the interpretation of the Commerce Clause, which gives Congress the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. At first, the court tried to distinguish between interstate commerce, which Congress could regulate, and interstate commerce, which only the states could control. Because most companies participate in both types of commerce, the courts had a great deal of trouble distinguishing between the two. If a company is canning vegetables, some of which will be shipped within the state and some outside the state, should different regulations apply to the canning of the same product? Is a shipment destined for another state under state control as long as it travels to the border? And at what point does it become interstate commerce? So over the years, this clause has been interpreted more and more broadly so that today the national government regulates a wide range of commercial activities including transportation, agriculture, labor relations, uh, finance and manufacturing. So almost no type of commerce is controlled exclusively by the states and the concurrent court interpretation of commerce laws is extremely complex. That, that's no joke, it's extremely complex. Now, the Commerce Clause in Civil Rights uh, has been surprisingly intertwined. Um, the Commerce Clause has been used to sustain legislation outside of commercial matters. In 1964, the Supreme Court upheld the 1964 Civil Rights Act, forbidding discrimination based on race in public accommodations because, and I quote, Congress's actions in removing the disruptive effect which it found racial discrimination has on interstate travel is not invalidated because Congress was also legislating against what it considers to be moral wrongs. So discrimination affects interstate commerce, and consequently Congress constitutionally could legislate against discrimination. Again, many years later, Hamilton's loose interpretation of the Constitution ensured that the principle of national supremacy prevailed over that of states' rights. Now since the 1990s, the Supreme Court has been limiting the national government's power under the Commerce Clause. In U.S. v. Lopez in 1995, the court ruled that Congress had exceeded its authority when it banned possession of guns within 1,000 feet of any school. The law was declared unconstitutional because it had nothing to do with commerce. In 2000, the court held that the 1994 Violence Against Women Act also overstepped the Constitution with the statement that violence against women had an adverse effect on interstate commerce. So let's look at the reasons for growth. Well, we're a big country. And many of the problems that we face, air pollution, water pollution, uh, any number of environmental things that you can think about, uh, those problems are national in, in nature, not state or local. And over time, what has also happened is, is the states have become dependent on federal funding to battle many of these problems. And the federal government, third, has stepped in and has try to equalize the distribution of wealth between states that are poor and between states that are not poor. So a state like California um, rarely, if ever, gets 100% of the taxes that they paid in back from the federal government. They're, they're distributed to other states who aren't as, I guess, fortunate as California used to be. Uh, to go back to civil rights, the inability of states to deal politically with some of their problems. Civil rights certainly fits into this. Um, environmental problems certainly could fit into this. Any number of problems um, in which the states are not able or willing to deal with the problem is um, 
is a, at a point where the federal government may step in. We see that right now with the with the move of cities like Detroit, Stockton, San Bernardino to file uh, to file bankruptcy, <coughs> which creates problems for the for state pension plans, and the federal government at some point will have to probably step in. And then finally, the national government is given provocative powers by the way the Constitution is written. So notice how the Necessary and Proper Clause has been treated rather loosely, as has the Commerce Clause until recently been treated rather loosely uh, by the courts and interpreted rather loosely by Congress. So when we look at, at, at that, we can see that these exercises of federal power come from the General Welfare Clause, the Commerce Clause, the Defense of the Nation Clause, the Elastic Clause. They're all big. Oops, looks like I duplicated the slide. So we're going to stop right here. We'll pick up um, with the courts and mandates as, as we look at the second part of chapter three. So this is the end of lecture number eight, and I'll be waiting for lecture number nine.